Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Clint Crable from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He uh, grew up in Kansas and got his ba master's and bachelor's degree from Kansas State and then a PhD from um, Nebraska in 1994. He's worked on whole animal energy, protein metabolism and rudiment, um, different um, nutritional and management strategies to adapt cattle, and he's won numerous awards um, for both his research and teaching, and he will be speaking today on the other aspect of ruminants in the United States on nutritional strategies related to sustainability and efficiency of the U.S. beef industry. Please welcome our speaker. So, is this on? I guess it is. Fabulous uh, set of talks. So far, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So Joel Caton, Dr. Bites, Merlin, thank you very much. Uh, Brittany behind the scenes does uh, the majority of the work and does a great job at that, being patient with people who are slow responders like myself. So I appreciate that. I'm gonna give credit here also to a colleague, uh, Samota Fernando, who's done a lot of the microbiology work that I'm gonna present today. Okay, so I'm, I'm tasked with talking about the, the U.S. beef industry. I'm a department head, so I promote all animal proteins, uh, but most of my research career was in the beef space, and so uh, that's what I was tasked by Dr. Caton with talking about today. So we've, we've been beat up here a little bit this morning already, uh, but we've had really good conversation, and so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to, uh, to frame this as where we're at, but also then futuristically opportunities to uh, where we may go. So the, the beef industry is traditionally segmented. So if you think about the cow calf, we have purebred and commercial herds that oftentimes leads into a stalker or backgrounding phase. So that's also results in a, in a period of a 120 day grazing period. It can be on uh, either native grasses or improved forages. And then ultimately, uh, calves from cows can either go directly to the feedlot as calves uh, or they go to that last finishing phase after going through some kind of a stalker or backgrounding growing type of a program. But I'd say the industry is really evolving rapidly into a total production system. In other words, we're an industry that will never be vertically integrated like the other animal protein industries. And that is a lot due to the fact that we have so many resources across the United States, right, uh, that are available and, and, and given for ruminant use, uh, which again is one of the advantages of, of the ruminant animal. Okay, so we think a lot about livestock and environmental stewardship, economic sustainability, social responsibility, all those aspects that go into uh, what we define as sustainability for livestock systems. Okay, so I flipped this around uh, just to think about some of the discussion we're having with regard uh, to today, uh, and that's the fact that social issues are becoming more and more important to us. So really the consumer uh, is driving a lot of decisions now for all animal proteins, beef also that are being made by the retailer feed down to the packing industry. Uh, and there's kind of a line, if you will, of, of divide between the packing industry and, and the feedlot sector in terms of, uh, again, communication or feedback of those societal issues relative to getting clear back to the seed stock. I'll say that's not necessarily true on the quality side, right, Bruce? We've listened to the consumer about what they prefer in terms of quality of, uh, of beef, uh, but maybe less so on these uh, socioeconomic types of issues. And so, again, those are important discussions that are ongoing. Okay, so let's think about the ruminant animal, and let's think about the advantages uh, of being a ruminant animal in addition to some of those, those disadvantages. Okay, so if we just think about the 0.785 billion hectares in the United States, 23% of that is water or federal land. A portion of that federal land obviously is used for, for grazing, for cow-calf production and stocker cattle production. Of the non-federal land, 
35% is range, 35% is forage, and about 31% is crops. Okay, there's over four and a half million metric tons of crop residues that are uh, produced annually. Okay, so if you do the math there, are 37 kilograms of byproducts available for livestock for every 100 kilograms of plant grown for human food. Why is that important? Because again, the ruminant animal, Mike, is equipped to be able to utilize those byproducts in a manner that we as humans uh, cannot utilize. Okay, so about 35% of the U.S. land surface is rangeland, native rangeland, suitable for root grazing ruminants. And ruminants, because of the big fermentation vat uh, called the rumen, can utilize the largest carbohydrate source in the world, uh, or the cellulose. And that microbial digestion then helps maintain the carbon cycle. So, whoops. Plants fix CO2 and release oxygen, right? Which is part of, our, part of the natural carbon cycle. So it, it's interesting, again, and, and these numbers have been shown, uh, both by Robin and then by Mike, the total numbers of ruminant livestock in the U.S. since 1975 when beef cows peaked has declined now to where we're about 30 million total cows, right? So if you think about methane emissions per unit of carcass weight, we've made significant positive impact on decreasing greenhouse gases in our ruminant production systems in the past 35 to 40 years. You don't hear very much of the positive things related to our management systems and, and technologies that have occurred. Okay, so then uh, if about 8% of total greenhouse gas emissions are due to agriculture. Half of that, about 4% about is greenhouse gas emissions, uh, comes from livestock per se. Where's the other 80% or 90% or 96% and why aren't we having the conversations around those? And so again, we're, we're kind of uh, torturing the hand that feeds us uh, in some aspects. Not that we can't continue to make improvements and we're working hard to do that, uh, in all of our livestock scenarios as we're learning about here today. Okay, so the rumen ecosystem, uh, uh, catabolic processes are known as fermentation, Louis Pasteur, uh, fermentation, the consequence of life without air, the problem and the inefficiency is the total number of ATPs goes from about 36% in glycolysis, 36 moles of ATP in glycolysis down to two to 6% depending on the VFA profiles uh, in anaerobic fermentation. Okay, but as part of that ecosystem in the room and then those anabolic processes are critical. Why? Because they provide very high quality protein uh, to the animal. Uh, and they also meet a lot of the other micronutrients like the B vitamin needs, again, of the host animal. So the advantages are effective use of those fermentation end products. If you go back to the old Bergman data, uh, Don, about 80% of the ME available to the animal comes from volatile fatty acids, but then also microbial protein and B vitamins. They can detoxify some compounds that are poisonous. Uh, a lot of undigested residues or the fertilizer discussion we had uh, is returned to the soil. And of course, in nature, it allows animals to eat and run and then ruminate. Fermentation continues on. Uh, at a later time. There are disadvantages to pre-gastric fermentation and, and those have been alluded to uh, in part this morning already. So energy lost as methane is about five to eight percent of the total caloric value. Uh, there's five to six percent energy loss as heat of fermentation. And of course that depends on uh, the effectiveness of the dietary uh, neutral detergent fiber. Protein, ammonia is lost, okay? So Mike talked about overfeeding protein. That certainly happens on the, on the beef side as well. Uh, and so that ammonia can be lost and, and, excre and excreted. 20% uh, of the nitrogen in microbes is also in the form of nucleic acids, okay? So you can't account all of that microbial protein as amino acids or contributing to amino acids. 
Ruminants are susceptible to acidosis and ketosis, uh, and they're also susceptible to a lot of other toxins uh, that they might consume. Okay, in, in beef production systems, again, we have this fermentation vat, we have this microbial population that can utilize uh, the uh, fibrous components that Mike said were zero energy value to you and I. So in, uh, uh, in some life cycle analysis, uh, it's been estimated that forage for cows and replacements is about 640 metric tons for finishing 18 metric tons grain about 140 metric tons this would be in in u.s production systems uh, and so if you do the math beef production uh, in this scenario uh, is about uh, 80 percent forage or greater again thinking about the life cycle of the whole system okay Ross just published a really nice paper in agricultural systems uh, sarah place who was a colleague of mine at uh, at Oklahoma State, now works for uh, Nebraska, not Nebraska, works for the National uh, Beef Cattlemen um, Association, um, published, published this paper, so did a, just a similar life cycle assessment. This is a really nice paper. Uh, I can give you, give you the citation to this if you're interested. But they calculated kilograms of dry matter per kilogram of carcass weight, okay, of hot carcass weight, grazed forage, let me back up, this would be the whole system. This would be cow through carcass, through her calf's carcass, okay? So it's the whole system of beef production for a cow. Grazed forage, 13.2 kilograms. Harvested forage, 5.1. Concentrate, 2.6. Other feed, 1.5. And total feed, about 22.3 kilograms of dry matter per kilogram of carcass weight. Uh, again, emphasizing the fact that beef production uh, is predominantly a forage-based system. Okay, a lot of a lot of debate about, and we've had the, the discussion this morning. Very nice talks about human and uh, animal competitions. Okay, and so if we think then about digestive physiology, and and then more specifically, if we think about the microbial fermentation, the microbial portion of that. Uh, some really interesting data uh, and thought coming out. Uh, and Dr. Fernando reminds folks that listen to almost every one of his talks that we're, if you're counting cells, we're really only 10% human, right? So even within our own digestive system, we're, we're vastly outnumbered by the microorganisms. Okay, so some of the similarities between the, the human microbiota and, and uh, ruminants relative to polysaccharide utilization. About 70, in ruminants, 70% 70 of the energy from microbial breakdown, uh, maybe a little higher than that, depending on the diet. Okay, but a, but a, but a lot of mutualism, a lot of, a lot of similarities. If you think about polysaccharides reaching the fermentation vat uh, in a monogastric in the large intestine, and in both cases, the point being that diet can influence the microbial communities that reside uh, in those various fermentation vats. Okay, at the end of the day, uh, all uh, that metabolism and anaerobic fermentation leads to, to uh, pyruvate, so glucose to pyruvate, uh, and then depending on the substrate and depending on the makeup of the microorganisms uh, that reside in the rumen of the large intestine, as a result of that substrate, we can end up with these different pathways. So either acetate, fermentation, propionate, uh, butyrate, uh, again, depending on substrate utilization by those microorganisms. Okay, so some key points is that polymers are, are converted to uh, uh, pyruvate, ultimately phosphorylated, and then they enter different pathways. Uh, those pathways are interconnected and feed back into glycolysis. Glycolysis produces pyruvate. Pyruvate is used for VFA production. And VFAs in the ruminant animal uh, are utilized for energy. The key point here is we think about methane production, okay, greenhouse gas production, uh, is that pathways that produce acetate or butyrate produce hydrogen uh, and 
pathways that produce propionate, lactate, and ethanol use hydrogen, okay? So already we see that there's a shift in our ability uh, to potentially manipulate methane production relative to the rumen, rumen ecosystem that resides within the animal. So this just shows, again, uh, those, those uh, metabolic pathways leading to those pyruvate and then the volatile fatty acids interchanging with glycolysis. Uh, but as you increase the acetate to propionate ratio, you see a linear increase in methane production. Okay, again, that is related to uh, uh, interspecies hydrogen, hydrogen transfer uh, and ability to maintain reducing equivalents, so NADH to NAD. Uh, and so again, you can see that in pathways that produce these more reduced compounds, propionate, succinate, lactate, ethanol, uh, the methanogenins decrease, whereas when uh, acetate and butyrate are produced, uh, hydrogen is produced, and so the methanogens are increased, and methane production increases. Okay, so there's, there's advantages then to having starch, as, as uh, Dr. Vanderhaar pointed out, in the diets of ruminant, and that's why we talk about that, uh, that 120 to 200 day feedlot period and beef production as being an efficient process because in that confined space, we decrease uh, methane production uh, in, those, in those feedlot scenarios. Um, also then an opportunity to think about what hydrogen sinks are available in the room and that we could potentially exploit to be able to uh, reduce compounds and produce end products not associated with methane. Okay, so bottom line is even, even in a, in a feedlot intensive uh, system like we have in the United States, if you do the cow-calf to the, to the feedlot, to the carcass end product system, uh, beef production is still 80% forage. So what are the opportunities then uh, to uh, either with probiotics, with changes in fermentation, with increasing uh, those types of compounds that use hydrogen, what are our uh, abilities to decrease methane in ruminant production systems? So this is one study that uh, Dr. Fernando and his, and his students looked at, uh, 120 steers with either high or low quality forage. So they had alfalfa and sorghum silage versus corn stocks, which are readily available in Nebraska. Uh, we think a lot about technologies and how long we're going to have those technologies, again, due to the social pressures. Um, and so this was with and without Menensen. And then also byproducts or co-products, if you will, uh, modified distiller's grains where he looked at the either normal or, or de-oiled uh, at 0, 20, and 40%. And I'm not, not going to give you a lot of the data, uh, just a little taste, again, of the of the, the methane data, what we're talking about here in terms of sustainability and, and decreasing uh, potential greenhouse gases. Okay, and, and so uh, in this study, high quality and low quality, more fermentation in a high quality forage, there was more methane produced. Uh, but if you calculate that again per unit of average daily gain, uh, you can see that that line flattens out and with the addition of menensin, which changes the, the microorganism profile in the room and towards more propionate production, you see a decrease uh, in methane production in those diets. So probably what's most exciting about this data, again, is, is looking at the, uh, the clustering or the structure of the microorganisms and do they change in response to those different diets? So this is just a total bacterial population, right? And so you can see a clustering. Uh, this was their control diet versus the low quality forage versus the high quality forage. Uh, and over here, we're looking at uh, with and without uh, uh, the distiller's grain. Okay, so what you see is that diet changed the microbial profile in the rumen 
uh, of these animals, depending on the substrate that was, that was provided to them. This is the archaebacteria, which would contain the methanogens, the, the methanogens, right? And so again, same story uh, is the clustering of those archaebacteria based on the type of diet that, that those animals were fed. Okay, also did a uh, metagenomic analysis, looking at just all, it's kind of a gross overview of all metabolic pathways. Uh, and I, I, again, just show you this to make the point that on a common diet or high quality for your local the forage we see this is, pathway. So this is linked to specific pathways that would lead to acetate to butyrate metabolism uh, and depending on that kind of makes a lot of different see different uh, metabolic pot pathways respond uh, leading towards those differences uh, in those in those end products, that's the propionate or butyrate. Okay, and then finally, again, this is just a, a different way to to show the same thing. This is going from uh, from high quality diet to the common diet, low to common, uh, high to, to low, and it just shows again uh, the shifts in those microbial populations and the pathways uh, relative to changes in, in diet type. Okay, so why, why is that important? Or why is that uh, advantageous for us to think about as we move forward? Uh, those of us that are, that are in uh, not only beef cattle, but in ruminant production in general, uh, it's because uh, that we know that methane, it's only the third time I've done that, all right? No, I can't get it to go back, there we go. Um, methane not only presents a problem from a social standpoint, okay, we know that it's energetically inefficient to produce. So it's more energetically efficient uh, if we can produce those uh, more highly reduced compounds, okay? So if we can decrease the thanogenesis, uh, we can improve efficient rumen function, and again, it's related to the recycling uh, of NADH to be able to guide those pathways towards more highly reduced uh, compounds. So dietary intervention is a strategy, is a viable strategy to change fermentation uh, in order for us to capture or improve efficiencies in ruminant production. Okay, so I come, come back to this uh, then with about five minutes to go here. Again, thinking about this in the, in the context of, uh, of beef cattle production and beef systems research, understanding that we have a wide array of substrate of, of nutrients, of roughages, of co-products available to us uh, in ruminant production systems, okay? So we're really thinking about how do we best utilize those byproducts not suitable for human consumption uh, to capture the efficiencies in these ruminant production systems. Okay, and for Nebraska, so this is a little bit self-serving, but this would be true for the entire Midwest, uh, as corn yields have increased, even on decreasing numbers of acres, uh, corn residue, cellulose, uh, has also increased. Now there's an assumption here uh, that forage is 80% of corn yield on a dry matter basis. And so you, you see the increase in stocks, if you will, corn residue uh, as corn yields increase. Okay, then you look at the concentration of our beef cattle inventory across the United States, uh, and you see that a lot of those cows are concentrated in the Midwest, where a lot of those 
resources are produced, where corn and, and soybeans are produced. Okay, I also had the graph in here that shows, as I talked about earlier, that the total number of beef cows has declined significantly from, a, from the peak in about 1975 uh, to where we're at about 30 million beef cows and, and 9 million dairy cows today. Okay, so the, the question that we're asking, understanding that we have a ways to go towards manipulating fermentation to improve efficiency of rumen function, uh, is should we be encouraging farmers to integrate cows onto existing farmland, considering the fact that the world population is increasing uh, at least uh, out to uh, 2050, and, and then when we see start to see the plateau, what, what are our opportunities for increasing uh, animal protein related to beef production? Okay, and, and why do we ask that question? Well, pasture is limited uh, and total production uh, per acre increases dramatically when we think about systems approaches to utilizing corn stocks or, or crop residues uh, in a complete cycle, life cycle or system of beef cow production. The other thing that really hasn't been addressed uh, to a great extent this morning, again, with, with social pressures coming on our, on our industries, uh, and that's the value of technology. And so what do we do if we have to give up those technologies? Okay, so a lot of data uh, indicates that growth promoting implants improve feed efficiency 5 to 15 percent, ionophores, uh, rumentin, 4 to 8 percent, Direct fed microbials, okay, and there's a lot of space to grow, a lot of work, a lot of interest uh, in increasing direct fed microbials that might have uh, similar, um, similar changes in rumen fermentation or result in similar changes in rumen fermentation as ionophores. Uh, our current data would, would suggest two to two and a half percent improvement in feed efficiency, depending obviously on the direct fed microbial, and of course, beta adrenergic agonists uh, improve feed efficiency 10 to 30 percent. Okay, so the opportunities for the ruminant animal is the fact that, as I indicated early, uh, if you go from east to west in the United States, north to south, and then if you consider worldwide or global production systems, uh, there is a wide variety of environmental footprint. So it's not, it's not easy to say that we can alter management here and it's really gonna change the entire production system because of those different environments uh, across that production system. Again, that's, that's the efficiency uh, and the advantage of, of the ruminant animal. Okay, so what that means is that uh, there's a place for extension still in the land grant system uh, in that we're going we're gonna to need to uh, help individuals understand how they can improve their own operations to decrease uh, the, their carbon footprint, their greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. Of course, de decreased days on feed, and as we, uh, as we increase uh, efficiencies uh, in terms of growth rates, uh, there's an opportunity there in the feedlot sector. Optimize use of fertilizer, Okay, on, on, on those pastures, and again, understanding how uh, manure, et cetera, has a positive impact on soil health is also an important area of study. More efficient use of solar and wind power for fencing and watering, uh, and then, of course, efficient use of water. Okay, so uh, bigger picture opportunities. Uh, is an increased understanding of, of genetics by environment, by management, by, by the social factors, okay? So Mike spent a lot of time talking about, gee, that's, that's very important in the beef cattle sector because we have a real opportunity to match genotype with environment to get the most that we can uh, in those production scenarios. So increased understanding of genotype to phenotype, Emphasis on precision management tools will be critical. Increase, especially in the beef cattle industry where we're segmented 
Uh, sharing information across the segments is a challenge, but will become more and more important. Genetic components of animal health and well-being, and of course, uh, consumer confidence is ultimately going to drive sustainability of beef cattle production. So in conclusion, beef cattle rely on forages for production. Uh, diversity of the microorganisms in a rumen suggests that we can manipulate those to increase those efficiencies further. Byproducts and crop residues, those components that aren't competing in the human space will be critical for ruminant animal production. Uh, in variation, environmental footprint should be, uh, should be individualized to the, to the landscape, to the producer, and we certainly need to know more about G by E by, by M by F. Okay, so uh, beef cattle production is the system from pasture to plate. My, nobody from Nebraska is here. Maybe some, uh, I stole that from my OSU days. Bruce likes that. Uh, but certainly beef cattle are very, very well positioned uh, to turn forage uh, into high quality protein. I am, I am out of time. I just gotta say, uh, I'm in that space where I have aging parents, right? Teresa Davis at uh, Baylor is doing some really cool work. Just, just think about, uh, and, and the point's been made a couple of times here, how animals can concentrate nutrients, right? And so, so uh, Robin, the total intake thing is important to me. If you think about elderly getting into the home, one of the things that happens, you can ask any registered dietitian, is their appetite decreases? But the amount of essential minerals, vitamins that you mentioned, and amino acids that they can get out of a three ounce serving of a steak uh, or eight ounces of, of milk, right, a glass of milk, is incredible relative to what they would have to eat to get those nutrients any other way. We need to tell the story uh, about the value of animal products for human nutrition. And I'll end with that. We have time for one quick question. Don? <clears throat> Taking off of the concept of Vandahar on the uh, dilution of maintenance, seems like we ought to have a focus on producing more calves per cow uh, to dilute that uh, cow cost. And do you have any comments going to twins or a litter? I don't know. Food yeah. for thought. Uh, I mean, the, the meat animal research. Meat Animal Research Center obviously spent a lot of time on that very issue. Uh, and at the end of the day, maybe it was a G problem, right? Maybe we didn't have the tools we have today on the genetic side. Uh, but the cow, that, that in order to increase the, the twinning, the cow maintenance actually shot up because of, the, because of the size of animals that it took to support those calves. So again, it's probably, it's probably a G issue, probably something that we could revisit, and it's a, it's a good point, good question. Let's thank our speaker one more time.